We have an excellent panel here today to analyze the supposed success of high-performing Asian countries and to interrogate the usefulness of PISA for international benchmarking. As well as a top-class panel, I'd also like to thank the Times Educational Supplement and the Mayor of London's office as well, both fantastic and generous organizations who are not just helping the debate to go on today, but make sure that the important debates in education are had throughout the year. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker, Professor Liang Ho Fan, Chair in Education at the University of Southampton and a distinguished visiting professorship at East China Normal University in Shanghai. With over 30 years of math teaching experience in China, Singapore, the UK and the USA, he's in a great position to go beyond some of the shallow stereotypes of education in the East and the West that are often dredged up in light of PISA test results. Um, our next speaker is Michael Shaw, former deputy editor and now program director for online learning at the Times Educational Supplement. He was one of the authors of Openness in Education, published this year by the United Nations University and the European Learning Industry Group, which maybe will be raised somehow in this uh, debate. He's sometimes accused of inventing happy slapping. I assume that's the term rather than the activity. We're also lucky to have Munira Mirza, De deputy mayor for education and culture, with a background in policy research, Munira has published a variety of books, including Culture Vultures, Is UK Arts Policy Damaging the Arts? And most recently, The Politics of Culture, The Case for Universalism. Following Munira is Andrew Old, an experienced math teacher and popular and controversial blogger. Andrew blogs on Scenes from the Battleground, where he's gained notoriety for his writing about behaviour issues in schools, and more recently for holding Ofsted to account for its many detrimental effects on teaching nationwide. Last but not least, Austin Williams is Associate Professor in Arch Architecture at XJTLU, I won't try and say that in Chinese, <laughs> in Suzhou, China, and he's also Director of the Future Cities Project in London, as well as acting as Managing Director for the first independent online architecture magazine in China. He's also busy organising a conference on education, East and West, to be held in China in 2016, and writing a book on urban futures. So each speaker will have four to six minutes to speak, after which we'll have a short debate on the panel and then give plenty of time for audience questions. So if we start with, I can't remember who I said was first, um, Professor Fan. I think there are a lot of things we can learn from Asia to improve our education. Of course, Asian education system can also learn a lot from European or other countries' education system. But today we focus on what we can learn from Asia. That's the title. So as a start, I should just focus on one of the many, many aspects I think we can learn. Uh, that is about teachers. I think my main point is all teachers, at least the mathematics teachers, because I'm a math educator, uh, should be specialists. In China, I would say almost all mathematics teachers are specialists. Uh, actually, no matter what they are teaching in primary or secondary or even higher level, of course. Uh, in particular, I think uh, the percentage of mathematics teachers who specialize in mathematics uh, compared to UK, it's much higher. In China, I think, I would say almost 100% of secondary school mathematicians got degree in mathematics. But here, the percentage is about 40%. And in primary school, uh, in China, all of the mathematicians, I think, are specialists. They might not have a degree in mathematics. They have a kind of associate degree in mathematics. Uh, but in UK, uh, it's less than 5%. So to me, I think it's a, the gap is, is just too big to ignore. Uh, it explains a lot of things. And also, they just teach mathematics. If you're science, you just teach science. You don't teach other subjects. Because I think teaching a single subject well in schools 
in modern society is already challenging enough. If you ask her to teach you two subjects, of course, we also see the advantage. But somehow, uh, the focus is, is diluted. Uh, so this is my, my main point. And uh, also, I, you, as you know, here, a lot of mathematics teachers uh, only have grade C in GCSE uh, examination. C in mathematics. This is really not enough. Of course, we also have excellent teachers of schools here, but I'm talking about, I mean, on average. So that's the difference. We should improve teacher education, uh, teachers' knowledge, and also teachers' professional development, which I might speak a little bit more later. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Van. <laughs> Okay, and then if we go to Michael. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd start by stressing that I think teachers learning from teachers in other countries is a thoroughly good thing. Uh, the Times Educational Supplement has been running articles about what we can learn from other countries for well, every week for 104 years now, so we take it very, very seriously. Uh, there was the incident in 1939 where we suggested that uh, we could copy certain examples of the Nazi education system, which had a very uniform policy. Uh, we, we draw a veil over that now, but otherwise it's been very, very positive. Um, and the key thing we see today on our website are teachers in different countries all over the world, including some of these successful East Asian countries, uh, sharing many of their ideas in our forums and among the resources. But my key message today would be about wariness over education policy tourism. There are a number of reasons for that. I think I've just got time to do two. Uh, the first one is wariness over any suggestion that if we copy teaching techniques from schools in country X, we will get the same results as country X. Uh, we know we will not. It might help. It might, it might, be, might be useful, and there, there are things we can learn. Um, but uh, imagine if we took several thousand young people uh, whose parents were from the most successful East Asian countries, uh, from South Korea, China, Japan, and we moved them to a different country. We had them in, a, uh, in Australia, say, a country that ranks midway, uh, well, above midway in the PISA tables, and they spent their entire schooling in that system. What would happen? Well, the result is they still do fantastically. We know this from research that's been done by John Jerram at the Institute of Education in London. Uh, in fact, he found that East Asian children in the Australian school system got a math score in PISA of 605 points. Now, that means if East Asian children in Australia had their own country, they would be the second highest performing country in PISA, after Shanghai, which isn't even a country. Um, so, although there are very, very positive reasons to mimic teaching techniques, culture remains a massive, massive factor. I think the second reason to be wary about education policy tourism is the, the blatant cherry-picking that goes on. Uh, it really is a raw shark test. Policymakers arrive in a country and will instantly spot the aspects of the system that they already agree with. Uh, so when Liz Truss was talking earlier this year about Shanghai, she wasn't saying, oh, we should be scrapping setting, we should have mixed ability teaching. She was immediately talking about long division and times tables even before she'd got on the plane. Uh, last week, we had Tristram Hunt coming back from Singapore talking about uh, uh, the rather patronising idea of a Hippocratic oath for teachers. I think if you want an example of a, of a warning story about education policy tourism, you only need to look at Sweden. Uh, about uh, seven or eight years ago, conservative policymakers were fascinated with Sweden. The free schools there were, the, were a wonderful model that we would follow. Yet in the PISA tables, Sweden then fell off a cliff. It went from being ninth place for reading back in 2000 to uh, the, about 34, 35, so the bottom of the table. Um, so that's another reason to be very, very careful. So those have been my, my three main points. Um, yes, teachers can learn from other countries, but be very wary about the potential biases and the impact of culture. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> okay, Manira. There, there is clearly a trend um, to compare uh, our teaching system with other teaching systems around the world. And I would say that um, apart from the, um, the obvious reasons uh, about knowledge economies and competitiveness and wanting to ensure that you know, Britain is at the, the top of the league tables, uh, those arguments have been going for a long time, you know, centuries. It's always been the case that education debates have been influenced by a desire um, for politicians and, and, and leaders to want to compete with, with other countries around the world. But I think more recently, the drive to compare with other education systems 
comes from a lack of faith in the grading system in Britain itself and the concern about grade inflation. So it's no longer sufficient to say our exam results in Britain are getting better because people no longer believe the veracity of those exam results. And that's why I think there has been a particular uh, keenness to try and look at scores that are taking place around the world, if only just to shed light on the fact that other countries are doing certain things in a better way, or apparently um, seems to be doing them better. So I think there is a rhetorical um, uh, uh, justification for why PISA uh, and other international rankings have really um, uh, become so prominent in political debates in this country. Um, and I can understand why, because um, it doesn't make sense if you're complaining or saying that there are problems with the education system. Lots of Stakeholders, lots of agencies, including teaching unions and others, will say, well, actually, things have got better. Look at the results. Um, so I think it is an important factor in the debate. Um, I agree with um, Michael that there is a problem with shopping lists and trying to pick and choose the things that you take from other systems. But where I think international comparisons are really useful is that they allow you to analyse how education systems develop, often in an organic way in relation to the culture of a country. And... I don't think culture is something that is inevitable or natural. I think that, that it interrelates with an education system. So people often talk about the culture of the Chinese and uh, the qualities of obedience that you see in Chi typical Chinese classrooms, uh, the authority of the teacher. And yes, those things are very well... Uh, those are privileged qualities in a, a Chinese system, but they do come from an education system as well. So uh, to some extent, the British education system over the last 30 or so years has devalued those ideas and seen, re regards them as old-fashioned. And um, I think the comparison and looking at what happens abroad is, is, is useful for that reason. The other um, comparison, I think, uh, or a reason to compare, I think, is useful is poverty. Often poverty is cited as the reason that, that, that you have so much uh, of a gap between the, the, the poor and the, the, the rich in, in this country in terms of attainment. Um, but if you look at other countries, you look at the material circumstances in places like China or indeed in places like South Africa. I just read a very interesting article about a school in Cape Town where um, the desire to learn is much, much greater despite the fact that children are going to school with empty stomachs and they're hungry and they, they've not had breakfast. So the excuses sometimes that are, or the explanations, I should say, um, in this country are not appropriate um, uh, or are not, not inevitable, uh, um, really. The, the, the final point I would make about China, the thing that I'm interested in, and I've talked to lots of teachers who went on that Liz Truss trip um, to Shanghai to observe classes, and I think that... Um, this point about um, subject knowledge and expertise is really important. We um, have a fund in London called the London Schools Excellence Fund, which supports teacher training in subject areas, because we identified that this was a real gap um, uh, in certain core subjects. And we funded some maths training. And the, the, some of the people who are delivering those projects have reported back to us that it is surprising and uh, quite... Uh, dispiriting to see how many teachers are teaching with very limited knowledge of their subject and are too afraid or lacking in confidence to say that because there isn't really a forum where they can admit that they don't know what they're teaching. And I think as we have to face up to that, that, that problem that sometimes teachers are not the specialists in their subject and we have to do the long, um, uh, arduous journey of helping them to, 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 um, to become masters in their subjects. And that, I think, we can learn from other countries and, and, and take note from. Thank you, Anira. <laughs> okay, over we'll to you, Andrew. Hi. Um, I mean, my usual, my um, expertise, if I have any expertise, is on what people argue about in education. And when it comes to international comparisons, and particularly um, with Asian schools, it's always about the teaching style, that whether it's more traditional or less traditional, and people try to prove a point about what's effective teaching based on that teaching style. Um, and all, not being first-hand acquainted with these systems, it's always a bit of a gamble. Is, is there anything in the argument? Um, and you tend to notice some suspicious um, tendencies in these international comparisons. One of them is that we can compare ourselves with um, certain countries and not with others. We, England can be compared with Finland but not with Korea or it can be compared with Germany and not Hong Kong. Um, it, 
often it's it's um, very vague exactly why. Um, usually, just it's just a culture. You all, it's almost as if they're saying, you know, certain parts of the world people there are just Klingons. They're not the same type of human beings. They don't learn in the same way. Um, what happens there is irrelevant. Um, and yeah, I don't think it's, whatever the culture is, I don't think anyone can make the impossible possible. So if something happens in one country, it must at least be possible. Um, the other part of that that I always find odd is that they often focus on students being very motivated in other countries and that being irrelevant. But at the same time, as Asian schools are dismissed as irrelevant because their pupils are too motivated, you hear teaching methods encouraged because they're going to motivate students. Um, very often the complete opposite of the ones you would see in those schools. So I think if you're going to talk about motivation as something you want in your own students, you can't ignore other countries for being too motivated. Um, a variation on that is they often focus on Japan because there has been reform there in a more progressive, uh, more Western direction. And then the comparison is, well, Japan is more successful than, say, the US. However, um, the gap has closed during that reform. Um, and so it's, it's, an, it's an odd way to be selective. Um, and still things happen in Japan that I would say, well, particularly if you include the, the shadow education, the, the, these private tuition, um, I wouldn't say Japan was... Um, you know, well, so I can't comment directly, but I've never yet heard a convincing case that Japan is the, the trendiest country in the world. Um, and, of course, it's not the um, highest achieving um, system in Asia. Um, sometimes it is used to prove a, a problem. Uh, the discussion of Asian schools is used to prove a problem with an academic approach. And I'm not, I cannot dismiss um, reports from people in those countries saying, um, you know, our children are stressed and they're... It, um, or the way we do things are unhealthy, but it's often with that based in no statistics. I mean, if you look at the youth suicide rates, you notice that the Asian schools aren't at the, the sorry, the Asian countries are not at the top for youth suicide. You will find that Canada and New Zealand um, are much higher. So, yeah, I've, and Finland, um, and yeah, I've had discussions where people say, well, we can look at Finland, but let's not look at Korea. Their kids are all killing themselves. Um, and yet, you know, there's no data in that. It is just, it's a stereotype. It, well, I would say it was racist, really. Um, I also think that sometimes we talk about those cultures being alien because um, children work hard and are highly motivated. And you just, I just think, well, in those, it, you look at middle class children in some of those um, local authorities where there's grammar schools that only 2% of the population go to, you will see 11-year-olds half killing themselves preparing for those 11 pluses. Um, I don't think we could look in our own... I think we could look in our own society for overstressed kids obsessing with exams. We don't need to go overseas um, to see that. Um, I do think it's useful for disprove, however, to use international comparisons to prove, disprove um, certain narratives in education. I've, I've been told that highly qualified teachers are likely to be less effective, and I think other countries disprove that. And I say that as a maths teacher with a maths degree. I've been told that I can't be expected to understand how to explain things to low, bottom set year sevens. I must just want to teach A-levels. Um, <laughs> Also, I do, there are practices in other schools in other countries that we've been told don't work, and they clearly work to some extent in those countries. Um, PISA tests are an all particular odd one because those tests are actually quite um, based on problem solving and application. They are, if anything, you'd say they were progressive tests. They were testing the style of exam that is most popular here. So t the f mere fact that East Asian countries are getting high scores on it disproves a lot of the ideas we have about how you teach problem solving. Um, certainly, uh, countries that say they teach in a way aimed at problem solving are often, um, yeah, far, well, are often far less successful. Um, and finally, and I think other people have mentioned it, that it can, um, people do find what they want in other countries. But I would say with that, sometimes if you can find it, it is still useful. Um, obviously not Asia, but Liz Truss going to um, preschools in France and saying, well, this is far more traditional than we have here. Well, if she's saying that it's better, then she is, it is just biased. But, 
But if she's been having the discussion with, about, with early years specialists in this country, she would have been told, you cannot make small children um, act in this way. You cannot teach them like this. It's impossible. So you can get... Uh, it's a good example, as I said earlier, of seeing what is actually possible. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> okay, Austin. Uh, thanks. OK, uh, I, I think I'm probably going to say some things that some people have said, uh, but I just want to do it on a couple of anecdotes uh, in some ways from my experience in China. So I teach in a university, not in a school, but I do see the end consequence of, of the way that schooling is uh, performing. And, I, and I've been to a number of schools in Shanghai and Suzhou to, to take a look at what goes on. So first of all, I teach architecture and when we do undergraduate interviews we get the students to bring along a portfolio just to show their aptitude so the work that they've done in school we want to see what they've what they performed and I can tell you positive stories but I wanted to try and put a bit of a negative spin on some of these things so uh, the one we, so we did get some great drawings but in general what we always get are two things one is a series of photographs taken on their holidays between the Gaokao A-level exam and the interview. So they've been on holiday, they've taken some photographs. This is an expression of their artistic uh, abilities. And the second thing we always get is a little photograph of maybe a glove, glove puppet that they made when they were eight, or a plasticine model when they were nine, or a crayon drawing when they were six. Um, and you say, why have you put this into a portfolio for a university uh, um, interview? And they say, because really I haven't had time to do any other drawings. I did, so the last 10 years. And they kind of, I mean, obviously it's absurd, but it's true. Uh, and for 10 years, they just study for the Gaokao. And they put all the childish things aside, like creativity. So when you kind of look at, um, uh, what do you call them, child prodigies, you know, you look at uh, the, the, the great pictures of China and you see warehouses full of people playing violins. Uh, they're all under the age of 11 because after that, they kind of, mainly 13, they just do the Gaoka. And it's social pressure, it's family pressure, it's peer pressure, that's all you do. So they don't read, they don't take exercise, they don't go to movies. Uh, this, is, this is slightly extreme, but it holds true for the vast majority of people. So it's a kind of a, it is alien, right? And I don't mean that in a racist way, I mean factually, it is weird. Right. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, so I think that's one thing to bear in mind when we when we're trying to compare how we would maybe incorporate some of these techniques. Second thing is is that we also have exchange students in our university, <clears throat> and uh, the civil engineering students who came from America and from uh, UK couldn't do the maths in civil engineering. And I thought typical Michael Gore's got a point. They just the typical crappy maths in Britain. They can't keep up with the Chinese. So um, I then asked the, the, um, the Chinese civil engineering lecturers why the mass level was so high, and he said, because we want to win awards uh, and prizes. And when you look at the Shanghai Jiao Tong uh, league tables, it's based on citations. I mean, oh, sorry, not citations, awards, trophies, medals. So there's this absurdist thing where they are teaching uh, almost the wrong level of maths, too high a level of maths, just to push and stress their students into kind of winning awards. And the British, fair enough, can't keep up. But ultimately, they're doing civil engineering. Why would they need that level of, of maths? So on that level, uh, it's kind of, uh, it's wrong. And it's also done in some ways for instrumental reasons that they want to win prizes. Now, I appreciate I have a maths expert sitting next to me. That's why I chose that example. So I just think that international comparisons are possible but they also have to have a little bit of nuance. And my worry is the Lynn Truss example is very interesting because, you know, she goes over there for two weeks and uh, understands China. Um, and I think that it takes a lot of time. I've been there for three years. I kind of don't get it. Uh, I'm, st I'm struggling to understand how it works. And comparing, you know, Britain with China needs a little bit more uh, nuance. If you compare, as you, I think you've said, Andrew, if you compare... China with Korea, you can kind of see this uh, hierarchical system of, of education. If you compare Greece with China, they have a road learning tradition and they have state control of education. So there's, you can have some similarities with different countries, but generally it is uh, you know, a symptom of their social political 
surroundings. It reflects that uh, and is reflective of it. Um, so it reminded me of Lynn Truss, where, thinking back to Sidney and Beatrice Webb, not that I remember it, but you know, uh, 1930s when Sidney and Beatrice Webb, the good old Fabians, went to uh, Soviet Union in the 1930s because they were so appalled by the moral and the economic collapse of the West that they just went completely head over heels at the evidence of Stalinist uh, productive forces and the fact that they were cohering people uh, on this kind of fantastically uh, new project for society. And they came back, and uh, obviously the rest is history. But they were suckered uh, into believing that this had some kind of dynamic which we've lost in the West. And you, you really see that what Lynn Truss and what lots of politicians are arguing is not really about education, but it's about the good old Chinese deference. You know, it's about... Uh, the idea that youthful acceptance of hard work and the respect for professors and the diligence to learn and all those things that we've lost from 1950s grammar schools. Uh, you know, we, we could, if we only we just introduced the Chinese system, we could reclaim that sense of young people uh, having, a, having a position to play in society. So it's, a, it's more of a political project than just the educational one. Um, and I think just pretending you can go to China and get a turnkey solution to social problems via education is very dangerous. Um, and I think the final thing I wanted to say is about PISA itself, which um, actually it's not a great test, uh, is, the, is the one thing to say. It's actually quite easy. Um, I could do it. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and the, uh, the, I mean, so in, in some ways, it's not so much how, isn't it good how well Finland and Canada and, uh, and Shanghai are doing, but how, isn't it sad how badly Britain's doing? Um, but the, uh, and actually, when you look at the maths tests, it's like one of those old school, you know, if it takes a man two hours to fill a bath, how many men does it take to fill three baths? Uh, it's kind of the one, it's like what I'd learned when I was in school, right? And obviously we don't do that anymore in this country, but in China they, they, they do, right? That's, that's part of the deal. So I think to conclude is, is um, benchmarking like these things about league tables tells us many things. Uh, it can give us clues, but looking to it as a scientific oracle saying that we can learn from these league tables something about education beyond the statistics uh, is, a, is a bit of a problem. League tables can't provide uh, educational answers. And the Chinese system produces excellence, but it's still a political judgment call as to whether we want to introduce it and whether we want to buy into it uh, or whether we think that something is a bit more valuable in maybe what we have, regardless of the fact whether our standards are actually comparable. And I read this quote by uh, Andreas Schleicher, who runs the PISA tests, uh, where he's singing the praises of, of, uh, of Chinese education because he says, teachers call up parents at least fortnightly to check on how their children are working. They also tell them how to improve their parenting skills. Thank you. If you want to buy into the Chinese education system, you have to go hook, line, and sinker, I'm afraid. So I think that uh, I think there's something good about a bit more relaxed uh, Western education, while at the same time, I think the educational aspiration of China is something we should look to. So it's a bit more nuanced, I'm saying. Okay, thank you very much. So all the, all the <clears throat> so I'm sure there's plenty of people who have points to make from the audience, but first of all, I'm just going to try and draw out some of the, uh, the debate on the panel. So I know Mike was uh, getting slightly bothered by how Andrew was describing the PISA test. I don't feel like we fully uh, interrogated, is this actually a useful test? Um, it, it's mainly a test of reading, writing, and maths. Um, what about the so-called creative skills, critical thinking, things like digital literacy, all these other kind of 21st century skills? Should, is that important for measuring in, in international comparison? Um, I was also interested in um, what a quote that I found about Finland is that they just want every school to be a good school. They're not even interested in w winning that global competition. So how much, regardless of whether it's a good test of, uh, of, of a schooling system or a, even a culture, how much are we actually competing? So maybe if I go to Michael first. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm, I'm, apologies for raising eyebrows uh, when Andrew described uh, PISA as being very progressive. Um, uh, Andrew is absolutely right when he pointed at the, the problem-solving results. Um, what happened a few years ago is you'd hear slightly potentially racist views that uh, when uh, PISA finally looked at creative problem-solving, then that would show them. Then, then suddenly all these East Asian countries that did really well at maths, but they wouldn't be great at creative problem-solving. And then the PISA results came out for that, and they were still at the top. Um, England and the USA did better. England was in the top 10. The USA uh, was about 11, but the, the, the dominant rankings were still the same. Um, but if you look at the, the creative problem-solving questions that PISA do, they're not really that creative. 
Um, the types of questions they ask, they give you an interactive simulation of buying train tickets. And then you're told, having clicked through a few pages, that uh, you need to say, you need to buy the cheapest set of tickets. So they're effectively logic and maths questions, that's all they are. It would be great if there was actually a real test of creativity, a test which said, you've arrived at a train station, the ticket machine isn't working, the barriers are up, what do you do? The problem is it's very, very hard to test that kind of creative knowledge. Um, so that would be, that'd be my point. It would be great to see if there, were, if there were a genuine test of creativity and how that would work internationally. Um, I mean, when I say that, I am thinking to, from the point of view of a maths teacher, in, in that it is all applied problem solving using maths, whereas perhaps if you really wanted to test um, mathematical ability, perhaps a few differential equations, that would possibly set apart um, different parts of the world for, and, and show a much greater difference than than that sort of problem. Is it, does anyone else want to come back on any of those points, Manira? Um, I think, I mean, PISA is just one test of an, a number of different tests and a number of different um, questions you might ask about the education system. I, I don't get hung up on one particular statistic because I think that would be a mistake. I also think there are tests internally within this country and variations that are interesting to look at. And, you know, anybody who is interested in education policy will, will have you know, hopefully have a sensible attitude to all these different um, indicators. On, on Austin's point about, you know, with, with the Chinese system, you have to take the whole thing, hot line and sinker, you can't just, ex you know, you can't just pick and choose elements of it. Um, I, I, think, I think that's not, I don't quite agree with that, because I think, um, just to go back to a point that Andrew made, which is important, is, is that it, what, it, something might be possible, and we're often told um, by education research and, and other things, that children can't learn in this way or children don't learn well in this way. And then if you look at another system, it turns out actually they, they can learn in that way. The, the context might be different, but it is possible. And it's that aspect of comparison which is really helpful. Um, and, and so I, I, I don't, you know, I think if you speak to Liz Truss and actually any of the people, the teachers that were on that trip, I mean, I've spoken to, you know, a, a few and you know, they're not, they're not naive. They understand that the context that they're in, they understand there's a political imperative in the, in the Chinese system. Um, but they, they, they do recognise also the, the, the vast difference in the expertise of the teacher, the expectations of the students, and those are things which actually we can affect, we can influence. I favour, um, you know, a, a balance. And, you know, I do think that the creativity in the UK system is the envy of the world. And lots of people come to Britain and come, you know, I get visits from people around the world who say, you know, how does the London system produce so many artists? And, and how can it be so creative? So there are things that we also have to be proud of. Um, but it is about striking that balance and recognising that there isn't an inevitable way in which certain children learn and, and so on. I think, first of, first of all, there is a misunderstanding about PISA and TIMS. Both large scale tests test a variety of thinking skills, or they, they call it high order thinking skills, or fundamental knowledge. So they cover a whole range. They emphasize problem solving as well. And if you look at the, the TIMS, that starts from uh, 1995, so a four year cycle. So many times, if we really look at PISA, all the time, for all aspects, issue students are better than UK or others. This is very clear. One of my colleagues are doing it, analyzing it, even for high order thinking skill, solving real life problems, even like what they don't have is hands on activity. Of course, it's a litting test. But I think there's no excuse to see. Or, or we are fine, or we are not so so bad in create, creative. Uh, like for us, yes, uh, London is a world center of like for creative arts or that kind of thing. But for mathematics, for science, I don't think you. If you test, the, you can design your questions for creative knowledge or, or problem solving. My hypothesis: Chinese students are still better. That is a debate. <laughs> but according to PISA uh, teams, they have over a dozen, more than that, a dozen. Or it's clear. Because when they design the test, it's very clear they have specifications, table of specifications. So this is for high order thinking, this is for creativity, this is for real life application, all are tested. That's the first thing I want to explain. And data are all there available online. Test items for teams 
Half are published, half you never know. You cannot get it. But half are published. Then for what uh, Austin said, I think many are collected. But the remaining are wrong. Yeah. I think there's some extreme, uh, uh, but he is very nice to admit that there might be some extreme. Chinese students have activities in sports, in drawing, in playing piano. They have it, especially for wealth uh, families, if they are richer. I have many, many cases. And actually, my brother is, is a kind of, you know, superintendent of a county for education. For when I go back to China, to talk to him, he's arranged a lot of those kind of things. They're not just focused on academic achievement. Of course, somehow they are learning from us or from other countries. They want also develop students' creativity or the ex ex uh, curricular activities and so on and so forth. That's what I want to say. <laughs> good. I'm delighted that your wealthy brother is uh, giving your ch his children a good education. Um, no, for that, but, Kandi, but, he's responsible as a Bureau Chief of Education Bureau Chief. He's responsible for. It, 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 yeah. it's, it's well, it's well, I mean, it's a half a million there, population. There's lots of, of Chinese people in the audience who can agree with me or disagree mm -hmm. with me, or I don't mind, right? But the thing is, is that I've been to schools mm -hmm. where they do the PE test, right? You have to pass the PE test before you can go to university. And nobody's done. I mean, the, this is unbelievably the unfittest nation in the bloody world, right? Uh, and they have to run a thousand meters. I've seen people vomiting, right? You know, you, because you have to pass it to get to university, so you'll do it. But there's not. This is not an inst uh, a, a general instructive uh, module within within schools in the way that it is in the West. And I think that this is the point which which Manir is making, which I, I think I disagree with, which is that when you talk about a cultured person in Britain, you're talking about somebody who can speak French and reads books and you know does goes to opera, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't have the same cultural norm in China because it's, it's very much based on kind of mathematics, uh, which is a, which is the one course which you follow through the entire uh, schooling system, and it's and it's it's very much kind of uh, identified with the way that China society wants to see itself uh, um, uh, promoted in in educational terms. So I think that. When you have uh, educationalists and teachers and Lynn Trusser and whoever it is, right, I'm sure they're not stupid people, but there is something naive. I read research papers where people say, I spent two weeks in Beijing and I found out that. And you think, hello, this is just crass <laughs> academic <laughs> bullshit, right? Because you didn't find out anything, right? And, and, I, and I don't want to kind of exemplify the mystique of China, but it's hard to understand China because it is so different. It is so different. And I think, you know, getting underneath some of these ideas, the fact that lots of children go to school at 6.30 in the morning and finish at 6.30 at night and then do cramming, and they do this six days a week, right? This is not something that we can just kind of tap into in the West. And that's how they learn, right? Now, there are other ways of learning in China, and, there's, and, and unfortunately, now the government is insisting in that kind of funny way that they do, that creativity will now become an agenda item, or, uh, you know. But, but, at the, but generally... That's the way it works, right? And I, and, I, and I think it's fascinating. I'm not criticizing it, because I think it's a, it kind of works for them. But generally, it is not something which is immediately transferable. Thank you. OK, there's a few more things I'd like the panel to talk about before we go out. Um, so we, there's some cynicism about what methods we can... We can't import these methods from this country because the culture is different. But actually, maybe... Um, it sounds like when you were saying the elements of culture, such as like the par parenting authority, teacher authority, discipline, and obedience, those elements of the culture that we like, and that actually it's the education system's responsibility to create the culture. So I'm just interested in if, what the pan panelists have to say about that. And secondly, I kind of this is more of what Austin is saying that kind of ha can you teach creativity, even if in Shanghai. Um, Liang Ho's brother is encouraging piano lessons and, p and kind of drawing lessons, PE lessons. Is that actually, is that just, you know, it could, might as well be math lessons. It's another kind of form of, t we'll, we'll teach to the test piano. It's not, still not creativity. So what kind of, do the panelists, what, what do we value as creative skills that, that our children should be learning in school? Okay, I do say, I mean, I agree with, uh, with Austin. I said, uh, what did he say? Many is collect. Uh, like in Pisa, they found that Chinese students spend about 13 hours per week on homework. 
and UK is about four hours. So indeed, the Chinese students Chinese student spend too much time. That's what I want to suggest to them. So you should reduce your time to do something else. But that dynamic thing, four hours per week on homework is collected. We should introduce it a bit more. I'm not saying you need to have four, uh, 13 hours. I say, no, you have too many hours. But four hours is above, below the average. <laughs> So I think we need, to, we need to work a, a bit harder. You don't say, oh, you're working too hard, so we don't work copy with it. No, that's a different story, actually. Yeah. OK, Manira? Um, you know, I'm certainly not suggesting that we translate. There's an immediate translation between the Chinese system or the Korean system or even the Finnish system to, to Britain. These are all, as I said before, about a context. But it is interesting that, for instance, in this country, there has for a long time been a nervousness about teaching children classical music, and musical instruments, and a sense that, well, it's very difficult, um, most children won't get it, it's not relevant to them because it's not their time. And yet in China, classical instruments and, and, and classical music are taught, and the Chinese enthusiasm and appetite for the Western canon of classical uh, music is much, much greater proportionally than it is in the UK. Now, there is a reason for that. You know, the, the discipline, it's very well respected as an art form. Um, children are brought up to think this is a high status to appreciate it. Um, those are things that you can't replicate immediately in this country. But what they do do is that they show that there is no reason why historical difference um, the time between when Mozart was writing his music and the time that we live in now is an inevitable barrier to children enjoying classical music. And it's that which makes, it, uh, makes China an interesting thing to look at in the British context. It's not about saying, gosh, they all teach their, their kids instruments. Exactly how, you know, how do they do that exactly and let's do it here? It's about recognising that there is, some, there is an alternative and that these are not insurmountable barriers. And, and it's that international comparison that I think is is the most useful. On deference and obedience, you know, I don't think that the, the culture of deference is in, in China is one that we would want to replicate. However, I would like some more deference in classrooms in Britain. I do think that the authority of the teacher has been undermined, and the idea of the status of the teacher as the master of a subject, um, which in China is, you know, does still exist. Um, you know, how do we cultivate that here? What are the contextual, cultural factors? What can be done to improve that situation here? Um, I don't think you need children to be studying 12 hours a day in order to cultivate that here. I don't think you need the drawbacks of those systems um, abroad um, in order to, to, to think more intelligently in a sophisticated way about the, the problems with our system. Okay, Michael. Just got one example from a, a school in Bury St Edmunds that I was at on, on Friday, and they've had a, a long-running uh, relationship with schools in Shanghai, and they've been looking very seriously at what teaching techniques they can use. And, and what I found fascinating there is the one they found most useful so far is about how teachers respond to pupils' answers. That they found that when they went to Shanghai, if a pupil answered incorrectly, the teacher would move straight on to the next pupil. Whereas their own teachers in Barry St. Edmunds, if they were asked, what's the capital of, of France, and a pupil went Poland, the teacher would go, well, it's in Europe, and it begins with a P. Uh, that's good. Um, <laughs> but, but no, 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 carry on. And... Um, uh, they, they found that difference. And so the head teacher, Jeff Barton, who's one of our columnists at TMS, um, went out an assembly to all the pupils and said, well, what would you like us to do? Would you like us to be a bit harsher? Would you like us to, if you get it wrong, just move straight on to the next pupil? And uh, the student said yes. So they've started, <laughs> they've started trying that. So this is an exact example of everything I was saying is wrong. I'm, I'm talking about one school I visited and that. <laughs> Here's something you can copy. Um, but the school also recognises that, that they need to try and reflect what's happening with the broader parental culture as well. So like a lot of primary schools, they are trying to instil that uh, aspiration for education among their parents. So I completely again, agree with what Manira said, that you can actually change cultures and that schools can play a part in that as well. Any other policy? You asked the question, can you teach creativity? I, I, mean, I hope so, because that's what my job is. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but I don't know what it means, really. Um, and I do know that it's fundamentally different doing it in China than it is in the UK. Um, partly because there's a kind of a, a very much a learned process. Um, and you think you've clicked, and then you realize they just learned a model, and then they want to move on to the next thing, and they, have, they don't see they don't see it as a process. So, I mean, there's, there's, it, I think it's a, just a fascinating kind of pedagogic uh, issue in terms of creativity, but in terms of like, um, 
this discussion. See, I don't think you need to look to China's 30 hours to then realize that four hours in the West is not very much, right? I mean, if that's the lesson, we don't need to, we don't need to say, oh, how many hours is uh, career teaching to realize that we don't teach enough or do enough homework? So these are just very, it's almost like we're too defensive to be able to critique ourselves without a benchmark of, of somewhere else. And partly because uh, the last example there of Barry St. Edwards is that, I'm just interested to see if that's being introduced because in some ways, the idea that you can challenge students, uh, and, you know, young students as well as university students, uh, and take them beyond themselves and tell them that they're wrong and you know dispute with them, uh, there's there's very much this kind of notion in in Britain of of bullying that you know if a teacher kind of insists too much and tells you that you're an idiot for getting the rocks to say Poland instead of Paris, that's bullying and you're not allowed to do it. Whereas you know in China it's still fairly upfront that you can crack them across the head. No, you, you, can, you, can, no, you can tell someone that they're wrong, right? And the point is, is that the students, because in many ways, this is a dynamic social force, right? It's not just an educational uh, abstraction from reality. This is you know, China's, China's future, right? This is the leading nation in the world in many respects. So they recognize that, you know, they want to learn. They want the future. They, you know, they, they have an ambition uh, beyond themselves. And through that, you know, the harsh processes to learn are bought into, right, because they think this is the way to do it. So, a lot, I mean, I'm just saying that regardless of what we think on the panel, I think that there is a debate uh, about how education is seen in a much kind of more um, uh, naive way in the West and a, and a defensive way in the West and a much more confident way in China. So some of that would be kind of quite nice, but I don't want to go the whole hog of endorsing tiger mothers and endorsing, you know, brutality within the classroom. You understand? So, yeah. Andrew? Um, I think on the point of authority and deference, perhaps we don't need to go as far as Asia. Um, you, you hear people say there's more teacher authority in, in France um, or even Finland, which is often seen as the most progressive model of education. I think that the abdication of adult authority in, in this country, although it might have affected other countries, is probably only in a few places. It probably is... Um, you know, uh, UK, US, um, someone, a speaker last night was saying in Sweden, but it's easy to find examples without actually going um, that far away. Um, and it, I think you can find examples in this country of schools where the teachers still have a lot of authority and, and um, even where parents have a lot of authority. And I think that's something we often miss with the comparisons, is that we've not got a particularly uniform system in this country. Um, as I've, I've been a supply teacher. I've, I've worked in a grammar school, an independent school, and some of the toughest comprehensives. Um, the variations in there are off between those different types of schools um, can be as wide as some of the variations people report between different countries. Um, one thing, though, that I think... Um, it's cute. I think looking at the Asian systems has highlighted is, is this point about creativity because it, it is fascinating to hear how our system is very uh, concentrated on creativity and other systems are very highly academic by comparison because there's a very strong narrative in this country that our system is too academic, that we're too focused on exams, that in, you know, in Ken Robinson's opinion there's too much maths and not enough dancing. So to, a to actually recognise that we might be on the creative extreme as it is and we don't need to push further in that direction, that is useful. Uh, sorry to you, Austin. The number for homework I mean, hours is 1313, not 30 because of my Chinese accent, <laughs> Wang Shui. Yeah, and uh, I think UK is about a four point something. I don't remember exactly. You can check, it's a published. And second is about the culture. Often we use culture very frequently and in a very general way. But I think we also need to think learning culture, teaching culture, classroom culture, school culture, uh, not as a whole society's culture, because culture has I mean, is accumulative and is collective, not personal, but it's a group of, of, of people, uh, their norm. So I think teachers and head teachers can do a lot of things in shaping classroom culture. Like what Andrew, uh, Andrew said, 
in UK, in some classrooms, in some schools, especially private schools, I think students are very well disciplined. They learn very hard. They are certainly world class. I mean, of course, they are world class schools in all the countries, at least in four countries I have been there. Yeah, but what we are thinking about is on the average, the whole system, we need to move forward. That's my point. Thank mm. you. All right, some really interesting comments from all the panellists. Now it's the, it's the turn of the audience. So in your opinion, which country has the best educational system in the world? It doesn't just have to be based on academics, but yeah, it can be based on other reasons as well. I've got two children, not in England, but in Germany at a secondary school, and I actually have a bit of sympathy for what our Chinese guest said, because I think my children are getting the worst of all worlds. We have this very um, uh, institutionalist sort of approach to education through Andreas Schleicher, who was mentioned here, who's a well-hated figure in Germany by now, because he's just so technocratic. But we also have what Germans call creativity, which I think is nothing else than just, you know, ideological nonsense. So I, I, my kids get it all the time. Um, my son had to write a little essay on um, Americans bearing arm the arms the other day. I said, oh, I've come across a really interesting article. You can read that. And then he read it. It was a spiked article, actually. And he says to me, Mom, I can't say that at school. Um, he's just come back from a class trip. We used to have class trips, which were educational when I was young in Germany. But now, German class trips are called tolerance trips. Um, and I said to him, when he came back, I said, what did you learn? He said, well, we learned to appreciate each other. Um, and the last thing, <laughs> the final thing is, he's got one hour of geography at school. He says to me, geography is obviously not important. And he's got three hours of ethics. So, I mean, if that is creativity, I think maybe we're, you know, certainly in our country, I would say, you know, we're not being creative at all with our kids. I was really interested in the point that uh, was made before about cultures being cumulative and collective. I'm an A-level philosophy teacher, um, and I'm interested in the discrimination between or the, the difference between genders. So girls consistently outperform boys, no matter what I do, no matter the seemingly the culture of the college or these kinds of things. H how does that factor into things? Is that because we have a different culture of expectations for girls or is it because there's something natural there? Is this nature, nurture? What do we think on that? I'd like to be a little bit controversial here. Could it have all to do with us just having gone a little bit soft uh, with our children? Um, we are... Uh, abdicating authority. We do not want to see our children fail in any sense whatsoever. Um, I'm talking about mollycoddling here almost. As a, as, a, as a child or as a young person, why would I want to work for success, and I mean work for success really hard, if I cannot actually feel any difference between being successful or between failing? There is no difference. We do not reward success, and we do not put something in place that makes failure feel painful. We mollycoddle. Um, if I want to be successful, I have to work for it. And there's no difference anymore. Uh, in, in most European countries, if youngsters fail, they feel that they are failing because they have to repeat the year or there is something in place. In the UK, you can do absolutely nothing for five years and then at the end of it, you fail your GCSE. But for five years, there was nothing there in place that actually made it feel painful and made you want to work harder. There is no difference. Yeah, I wanted to kind of touch on something which is kind of... Un I think it's underlaying a lot of what's been said, but just hasn't been mentioned explicitly, which is what is education for? What, what are we trying to produce with education? Is it productive econ uh, economic units? Is it creative and self-fulfilled human beings? Is it critically engaged citizens? And there's been a lot of talk of creativity, but not actually critical thinking, um, which is, I think, something slightly different. And isn't this going to put quite strong limits on what we can borrow from a lot of these education systems which are in uh, politically authoritarian countries? Okay, so we've got creativity, a load of ideo ideological nonsense. Which country has the best education system? What's education for? And a really interesting point about success or failure. I think it's particularly interesting with regards to China, which obviously has much less of a welfare state. So, the st you know, succeeding in the Gaokao really does have a very strong success or fail kind of impact on students' life afterwards. So let's see who we can start with. On, on the point of what is education for, um, I, I, I think a well-rounded education can create, a f uh, can help people live a fulfilled life. And it doesn't have to contradict 
a, a strong economy in the future. I'm sorry, I'm not making sense, but I don't think there's necessarily a contradiction between economic growth and having an education system that is that creates well-rounded citizens, if you see what I mean. And it's interesting that in China, um, part of the drive for creativity is a recognition that the, econ the, the economy requires industries like design and homegrown brands, not just importing um, what's, going on before, uh, what's going on elsewhere, because they recognize that that is also an economic advantage. So um, creativity is not necessarily something that's opposed to economy. And, and likewise, um, I think um, you know, our um, uh, uh, well-rounded citizens um, who live fulfilling lives will contribute indirectly um, to uh, in other ways so I, I don't think it I don't think it quite makes sense as a, a, a as a difference and sometimes you hear people saying well we don't want um, we don't want to teach in an academic way because we are not just producing workers for a factory and I think teaching in an academic way actually has also helped produce some of the best artists in this country we think about the artists that have been internationally successful half of them went to private school to grammar school and hated their education you know, from Richard Wentworth Anthony Gormley Jeremy Dello they all went to public schools and you know hated the education they got but they you know they in a sense their resistance to it their kick against the authority also helped turn them into the, the artists that they are so I don't think it's necessarily the case that um that that approach stifles creativity, and in some ways it has been the foundation for, for a lot of these artists. Um, Michael? There, there are quite a few different questions there. On, on the question about uh, changing culture and girls versus boys, um, it, it gets treated nowadays uh, in the UK as, as if that is a immutable fact, whereas in fact in, in the 1980s and the CES, we were saying, will girls ever overtake boys in these particular subjects? Um, so, so results can change, cultures can change, the up and down of countries in Pisa just over the last 10 years, the fall of Sweden, the rise of Poland, uh, shows that um, uh, academic results within a country can change as well. So that, I think that's very positive. On the um, what is education for, um, I once ran a, a series of articles in the TES on what is the purpose of education that really wound Andrew up. Um, so I think he even changed his Twitter avatar in response to it at one point. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I would go for something progressively and uh, progressive and hippie-ish about uh, engendering a, a love of learning and to want to carry on, carry on learning, frankly. And on the what's the best country for education, uh, that's a really, really hard one. Uh, my personal preference is probably for Finland, based on the fact that they've managed to, to stay in the top ten. They've got very, very high results, but a very, very low-pressure system for students. Uh, and when I asked one of the uh, Finnish teachers how they felt about Finland dropping out of the top ten of PISA, they said, well, it's a bit like not winning the Eurovision Song Contest. I mean, they were wonderfully un unfazed by it, and I think that's positive. Andrew? I've got to go for the what is education for question, because this is one of my recurring um, complaints. If, if this was a panel about health, and there were doctors and, and health policy experts, no one would say, what's the point of hospitals? <laughs> what's the point of doctors? Is it to make the workforce healthier? Um, is it to have a fulfilling life because you are healthier? It would just be accepted that it is better not to be ill. Um, and I think with education, we're scared to actually sa say that it's better to be smarter than less smart. It's better to know more than to be ignorant. It's not a means to an end. The end of education is to improve your intellect. That's the purpose. That's what makes it education. That's part of the definition. Um, ev every time you start saying, well, is it for this or is it for that or is it for that, it misses. It's an intellectual aim, and once you've got the intellect, just like when you've got the health, you can do what you like with it. Um, and the, the alternative, um, R.S. Peters summed it up, and I'm always quoting this phrase, that the alternative is the idea of schools as orphanages for children with parents. The, <laughs> the idea that school's there to um, socialise, to be a substitute parent, to have the correct values rather than the values of these working class parents who can't be trusted to raise their kids the right way. Um, it has to be, it's about the intellect. Um, creativity, I think, is part of the intellect, but it's not a well-defined phrase. Um, it goes all over the place. Um, and it, it, it's more useful to break it down. Do you want people who are artistic? Well, I think that's part of the intellectual and particularly knowledge of the art, it's part of the intellectual canon, it is something that's worthwhile, but being artistic is not always the, uh, the same as being creative. There are you know, definite skills in music 
and art that go beyond just simply creating. Um, you know, there's te a technical part as well. Critical thinking, um, it's another one where what do people mean? How can you break it down? Most thought um, is critical in one way or another. You do want people thinking, but knowledge isn't opposed to thinking. You learn more knowledge, you can think better. Um, so sometimes it, it's just the idea that there's some kind of inert knowledge and there's knowledge you use, and that's critical thinking. And I, I think that's a false distinction. Worse, though, is when critical thinking is, you know, li it's literally criticism, it's rebellion, and that's seen as intellectually um, a higher end than agreeing with people. Um, you can do a great intellectual endeavour and still end up agreeing with, with the establishment or with authority. I think... Thomas Aquinas is no worse a philosopher for the fact that he ended up agreeing with the Catholic Church, having worked through all his ideas. Um, people, you know, do will romanticise a philosopher like Bertrand Russell, who was more of a rebel, but he spent his time proving that one plus one equals two. He was also proving things that people already knew and was already the established view. It's not where you end up that determines... Um, whether you are reasoning well, it, it's the process of reasoning. You know, being a rebel can be intellectually justified, it can be adolescent and pointless, and the same with conforming. It can be unthinking, it can be a deliberate and sensible choice. What's just been said, I, I, I agree with uh, wholeheartedly, except that I have a problem with the critical thinking discussion because often it's not well first of all it's everyone says it and nobody knows what it means and secondly there's certain things that you're not really sometimes allowed to criticize uh, that there are certain orthodoxies and mantras which have now become mainstream if a student said that they wanted to design an unsustainable building you would be told you shouldn't do that because you'll probably fail. It's like a, it's a moral no-no. Is that in China or the UK? UK. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. You can't tell the difference. No, in China, sustainability means something completely different, mm. right? It means growth. <laughs> it means the opposite of what it means in Britain, as it happens. Um, but that's a translation problem uh, uh, and a social ambition. But, but in terms of, and this is not just UK, this is in America, in, in mainstream Europe, there are certain things that you are not allowed to be critical of. Uh, and, and that list is, is, is growing, and I'm slightly worried about that within the, within the creative arts. Because I do think that the, uh, the, you know, the, the answer to the question, what is education for, is kind of everything and nothing. Uh, and the idea that education for education's sake is a fundamentally important uh, mantra that we should hold on to is, is, uh, is, is highly important. Within that, obviously, you then have to do the everyday job of actually making sure that people do get educated for a purpose. But I think once we, once we treat education simply as an end, uh, sorry, a means to an end, and that end is employability or skill sets or you know, oven ready students who are going to get a job, then I think we will diminish the open endedness of what education could be and in the enlightening process that education has the potential to develop within children and just shoehorns them into a career pattern which uh, I think uh, is actually uh, doing children down. Okay, Professor Fran, what's education for? Yeah, well, uh, uh, maybe I go to the first question first. Uh, so what is the best education system? I think, uh, like, Austin, I also don't have an exact answer, but I think it's in educators and education reforms dream. They know it can be improved. So you can always improve it. Uh, so like in mathematical limit, sometimes you cannot reach it, but you can always get closer, closer, closer. Yeah, but if you go down to concrete issues, somehow I can ask. Like I won't say Chinese education system is the best because Chinese educators are more critical than us of Chinese education systems. Yeah, and I think they are more critical than you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and Gaokao is certainly a bigger problem. But when I talk about the teacher quality, I think a Chinese education system probably has world-class teaching force. They are very diligent. 
they work very hard. They pursue professional development very hard. And uh, they develop strong knowledge. See, is, I mean, in terms of content they're teaching. That's what I can say. I mean, if you go to uh, details, I can tell what is better, what is not so good, what can be further improved. But uh, in general, what is the best education program? I think this is in, maybe in your mind or in your mind, in my mind, uh, yeah. And uh, for the second question about the Germ German education system, I think German improved in terms of uh, PISA result, improved quite a lot. Uh, I'm sure they have done something on it. But what the case you quote is a special case, so I cannot comment too much. Then for culture, maybe like, uh, I, uh, may, maybe I don't comment now. For boys and girls, I think the difference is because of their learning behavior. It's been for young students, like in primary school, in Singapore they have PSLE test. Girls are always better than boys. I think not because they are smarter or, or, or sillier, I mean, but, but the, their learning behavior. They spend time on it. Uh, I'm not saying they, they spend too much time or too little, but I just stated a fact. And, uh, so there is a policy debate. They say whether you should lay, lay the bar for girls. I think this is not equal, you know, for, 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 for ent entering second schools. What is education for? I think education is for probably everything. Not, a ju not a just for creativity, just all, but also for providing a strong working force for developing economy. If your education system does not provide such a kind of working force for developing economy. I don't think this is a world class education. This is the minimum, I think. Thank you. We've got 20 minutes left, so be as short and snappy as possible. A question was asked earlier, and uh, Andrew answered it very quickly. He said, well, what are hospitals for? They're for making people better. And uh, his heart was in the right place, but uh, what, what's happened is a massive evasion of the question. Now, when you look at this session that you put on the title of it, I think the whole title of this session, this session in its entirety, is a cipher for something else. It's to try to work out what we think education for is in Britain. And we don't know. We don't know what schools are for. What is the, more, what is the purpose of a school? What is its core mission? Because we just don't know. And we don't have that debate. We evade that debate time after time. So is it when New Labour were in power that we solved the wider social problems of society? Is it about some therapeutic instrumentalist imperative? Or is it when the Tories come to power that what we say is, well, great inflation was a problem, let's make exams harder. And so what we now have is that the curriculum effectively has been redefined in England to whatever comes up in the test and everything else is ignored. We just don't know. So let's have the argument out. And sending people over to China or Singapore, fair enough, if you want to do it, fine. It's not really going to get you anywhere. It is a cipher for something else. We evade that question. The last speaker mentions the economy. I ban the word economy and career, and I, I, I run a sixth form. How dare employers or anybody else or government think that anything we do in the school is to prepare young people for employment and careers and to make Britain PLC competitive? Absolutely not. Now, if you disagree with me, let's have a debate about what we think schools and education are for, and that's what absolutely mission. That's what's missing. I have a very clear sense of what I think it is to be an educated and cultured person and what a school should be for. But time after time, we feel to have that debate in this country. Uh, you, the, as often in discussions like this, the creativity word has, in my view, dominated. Um, but surely that you, you've, you've used creativity to assume that's only related to the arts, at least in the way you've expressed it. Uh, what I think you can take if the, if the question is about world-class education is that creativity does come from discipline. Uh, if it comes from discipline, then you get Einstein. You know, science and maths are just as creative as any other creative subject. I believe you can learn that from China or Korea or any other Asian country to the extent that they're pushing knowledge in a disciplined sense and they appear to be developing some sense of creativity. Isn't that just the end of it? I mean, that's it. So we get, we know we want to be creative. It comes from knowledge. Let's start doing that in Britain. Because I, I agree with Kevin Rooney partly. I think he's gone a bit too far on some things. But the key thing is we're just not, we don't know what we're doing here and we've forgotten. But I've got to be, say, say to Manera, for example, 
she's um, working for the Mayor of London, I believe. So I believe that the <coughs> current government or the Mayor is pushing subject knowledge. So to that extent, they're going in the right direction. Is that, it, could that then lead to the creativity we want? I'm a master student from the University of Manchester. I'm studying sociology and I'm from China. Uh, I can tell something from my own experience, actually. Um, first, I want to make two comments. First, I think creativity is about horizon. Actually, it's also associated with social class and also about, you know, the development level of one country or say one society. Also, uh, the second point is that I think critical thinking cannot uh, be generated or say be motivated without a huge accumulation of knowledge and a solid foundation of uh, knowledge. Um, I spent two years in China uh, to study English language and literature, and then uh, I participated in a two plus two program to come to University of Manchester to study sociology and linguistics. And after four years, I got double degree. Uh, in those four years, actually, I feel, I can feel very clearly the differences between China and the in, uh, English higher education system. The first one, I think, uh, in, in England, we do have very good, or say world-class university, but we don't have world-class students. Or say the English students are really not so hardworking like Chinese students. My, uh, my university in China is Sanyasen University, a top 10 university in China. Well, University of Manchester is top, top 30 university in the world, or say top 40 university in the world, but my university in China world ranking just 300. I think the China students who come through the two plus two program to, to England, they are actually, you know, much, much more hardworking and I don't think they are less critical. There is this, um, I, I think it started at the beginning, this idea that you can't actually go to other countries, look at what they do and say, let's do it here because they come from other cultures. I think that's nonsense. Different countries do lots of different things and you may well find something that another country does you might want to take. It's very interesting that colonial education, British colonial ed education, is still strong and regarded by the countries who use it as something valuable. And when they come to this country, they're quite shocked to see what has happened here. Now, nobody has touched on something that runs through our education culture, and that's what I call rote phobia. This idea that if you learn something by rote, this is something absolutely terrible, and it's associated in a very bad way with the Chinese methods of education, particularly Singapore maths, for example. Now, I happen to run an educational charity. Um, we, had a we normally specialize in literacy, but we had a great demand from our parents, who all come from what are called disadvantaged backgrounds, for maths teaching, after-school maths teaching. At the same time, when we were appealing for mainly graduate students, people like that, to help us with voluntary teaching. Lots of them actually were from Chinese background and specifically from Singapore background. One of them was actually doing a postgraduate a degree at Institute of Education. She set up maths classes for her, our children. She wanted to do an experiment, by the way, with them. Could we divide them into two groups? One lot would do the rote learning, the other lot would not do the rote learning. The rote, which we had to address particularly our children's ignorance of multiplication tables. They really, really are not taught multiplication tables. This was something that concerned their parents. I'm right. going to try the and take okay, some more the speakers. Rote learning <laughs> the rote learning children outperformed the others, but all were poor, by the way, at problem solving. Um, I have a, I'm naive, and I have a simple question for Professor Fang. If we are to improve UK education and get them higher up in the PISA table, where do we start? I'm an artist. I think creativity is often mystified. Um, it's very rarely, if ever, magically putting, uh, creating something out of nothing like Ken Robinson seems to think. It's mostly putting existing things together. And what you put together and the skill with which you put those things together determines the results. So if you know about the world and you've learnt some ideas, the results are more likely to be worthwhile. Knowledge does not stifle creativity, uh, it's the foundation for it, as Munira said. Firstly, from a student's perspective, I just want to come back from earlier and say the students do fear failure. Um, 
of the people that don't fear failure, and there are a few, are probably fear, not bothered because they don't see a future for them at the end of it. Um, so if they're going to be educated, they need to see that they're going to get something out of it. My second point, um, you should only rely on statistics. Um, well, you shouldn't just rely on statistics, rather. Um, an example of that is mental health issues. Um, a huge number of students and teenagers suffer from mental health issues, but it's an invisible epidemic. Um, that's just one example of what, what statistics don't measure, um, so just don't over on them. With regard to the supply of specialist maths teachers in the UK, may I suggest that the demand for specialist maths teachers exceeds the supply, and that's why we have to have immigration. Whereas in China, the, the supply exceeds the demand, particularly because it's a vast rural population with a vast amount of unused intelligence. The speakers have about two minutes to give their final remarks. Manira? On what is education for? Um, I think it's to reproduce and progress civilization, And that, in its broader sense, also includes productive economy, includes industry, includes other areas which contribute to GDP. But it is not defined in a very uh, shallow, instrumentalist way. And if we need more scientists because civilization needs more scientists, then I think it's good to make that point. I don't, however, think it's about creating deferential employees, and that would be a, um, a, a very um, reductive formulation. But I do think that um, you know, it is, it is interesting and notable that we do not have that many engineering graduates in this country compared to um, the level of education that our children receive. And so it points to, you know, why is that? And why did those areas, those subjects, not um, um, seen as aspirational or, or um, things, things that students want to pursue? On um, um, uh, Kevin's point about, you know, where, we, why, why can't we have the debate in this country? Why, is, why, is, why are teachers teaching to the test? I do think there is quite a clear signal, actually. Um, there was a clear signal from Michael Gove about subject knowledge. I, you know, I bang on about it constantly. Um, so certainly at a political level, um, it's been stated, although it's not been hugely popular and, you know, uh, Obviously, um, Gove um, was criticised for it regularly. Um, but the, I think the real challenge is in the teaching profession itself. And, um, you know, why do teachers teach to the test? The national curriculum doesn't force you to teach to the test. What is it in the school system that is so terrified um, of teaching knowledge for its own sake or education for its own sake? And um, I think there is a question there about the, the, um, uh, the, the profession... Um, professional development. I mean, we have lots and lots of different projects, just to plug things like the London Curriculum, which are about a broad subject knowledge base um, in different subject areas about, um, you know, teacher training. You know, these, th there are things coming to the fore now, um, but the teaching profession, I think, um, also has to have that battle of ideas, um, which, which is crucial. Um, in, and then finally, on international comparisons, I think they are as useful as historical comparisons. You know, we often talk about how things used to be. Um, someone said last night in a debate about parenting, um, there was no golden age. I don't think there is a golden country. I don't think there's another country out there that has a perfect education system. They're all flawed. People point to Germany as having a fantastic vocational system. But yeah, you're right, there are, there are problems there. It's about just having an intelligent analysis or a survey of what else goes on to recognise that our system, the that there is nothing inevitable about an education system, that it is ours to control and to shape. Someone asked uh, how to, I wanted to always start to improve PISA. I do think, have some suggestions. So uh, we need to pay more attention to fundamental knowledge. Students need to memorize. It's very disturbing when students cannot do multiplication table, cannot add two fractions, cannot do division of two fractions. I think this is a must. Uh, they need to memorize. They need to spend time. They don't just, oh, I have creativity. I don't need to memorize, OK? Second, teacher needed to spend more time on academic things, like the German uh, attendee pointed out. You don't spend three hours to, to teach students about ethics or something else. You spend all the subjects, not, okay? Other, the third is for teacher, teacher education. I think we need to improve teacher education. This is what I'm also trying to, to do. Yeah, thank you. I agree with the last uh, couple of uh, contributions. Uh, the teacher who asked uh, that this has been a very terrible session and we've let him down and we haven't discussed the core issue of what schools are for. Um, I agree with Manira that actually that's also your problem, possibly more than our problem, uh, that uh, teachers are becoming very defensive in this discussion and maybe they, they have a duty to maybe take this on board themselves and create a discourse uh, to try to raise the stakes. Um, because, I, I mean, I agree with your formulation, 
that there's, a, there's many ways that we now see schools instrumentally or there's end results that we seem to be kind of uh, targeting within education rather than just seeing education as a good in itself. Uh, and I think that in some ways teachers really need to stand up to this and stop this nonsense. And because it's not just teaching, right? I mean, I'm an architect, right? It's exactly the same within that. I think you'll find in most professions there is a utter defensiveness to actually understand what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it. And maybe we're just doing it for just general social cultural betterment, right? Without any kind of instrumental end result, which is why I take issue with the student who, you know, does this thing about students, we, you know, the reason we don't work very hard is because we don't know whether we're going to get something out of it. I mean, that to me is the, is the low point of, of education, right? You get out of it, A, what you put into it, and B, you get out of it an education. We don't get, give you a job. Uh, we, I mean, we might give you a reference letter, but that's about as far as it goes. Uh, and, you know, you have to see education. One has to see education as a general social human development uh, of trying to understand the world. And uh, f for me, that's the end of this, this conversation, which is that uh, you know, there, there's, there's no country which has a kind of monopoly on, on education. It's a, it's a universalist uh, development. So you know, the more we know about the world, rather than just seeing it as a test or seeing it as a formulaic kind of league table, but really understanding the world, then we can be more creative, we can be more understanding, and we become you know, better uh, global citizens to, to really take the next level of, of education forward. When I use the medical analogy on the debate about um, purpose of education, it's not to avoid the debate, just to suggest that the way to resolve the debate is fairly straightforward and easy. Um, I think that what we have seen is not actually a complete lack of debate, but just a, a debate where the easy answer is left out. Um, I've had a lot of inset in the two or three years ago where teachers would have to be given a um, figure of a human being and told, that's your school leaver, what qualities should they have, what are we trying to get our school leavers to be like? And I'd be saying things like intelligent, good at maths, and people would laugh and say, that's a funny joke, now let's write something else about creativity <laughs> and resilience. Um, I think, yes, we do have to have the debate, I just think that the answer is fairly easy. Um, it's great to hear how many, much people have mentioned knowledge. I think on that, though, we're now getting to the point where everyone supports knowledge except for a handful of people who think you can Google it, everything. But once you get on to discussing knowledge, you suddenly discover that there's a real difference in what people are think, think are worthwhile. Um, I would avoid using the word rote to, avoid, to describe facts. Um, I teach a lot of facts, I teach times tables, I don't teach them by rote, I teach them and explain them at the same time. So it's not, with, facts don't have to be without understanding, there's very few things that are actually just literally rote, but at the other, on the other hand, I don't want the other extreme of where everything's some kind of very vague notion of understanding and you don't actually know anything. Um, I think we need to discuss what is worthwhile knowledge. Thank you. All right, Michael. I, I think I'd end with a note about starting points. Uh, there's the old joke about someone asking for directions and being told, well, I wouldn't start from here. And um, we have that in international comparisons in education. Um, we are, this is where I actually agree with Michael Gove, where he talks about England having different challenges and maybe needing to move more towards a, a maths-focused curriculum, whereas at the same time we look at South Korea and how it needs to think more about creativity. Um, where this is also fascinating is in research done by, I think, two of your, your colleagues at the University of Southampton recently, comparing lessons in Nanjing with Southampton. Um, and what they found there was that the, the teachers in Southampton were teaching less to the whole class, they were doing much more individual teaching, and overall they got worse results. But the thing that didn't get reported as much is that the children in the schools in Southampton improved far more. Uh, these teachers were dealing with pupils who were starting from a lower base. And we have to kind of recognise where the students are in our system before we start thinking about it. Um, and as for the point uh, where I was questioned about uh, whether I was claiming that we can't learn from other countries, absolutely not. Uh, I think we can. Um, but in the findings of Nanjing, they found they weren't using rote learning at all. Uh, so lots of questions to ask, and I think it's been a fascinating discussion. Yeah, it has been. Let's give a round of applause to all the panellists. <laughs>